Hello, this is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, and today we're going to talk about Bruckner's Symphony Number no. 6. It used to be one of his least popular works. Now it's one of his most frequently recorded, not because the people recording it know anything about it or play it with particular intensity, perspicacity, or intelligence, but rather because it's short and it's the easy Bruckner symphony to do for people who don't ordinarily do Bruckner. And so there's tons of them out there. And I'm going to tell you what the best recordings are, in my opinion. But I want to talk about the work itself. And I really want to talk about it in the sense of getting some understanding of Bruckner's really unique and fascinating handling of form. You know, I did a, a video on sonata form and what it is. And uh, some of you may recall that, and some of you may already know what sonata form is. Now, Bruckner thought he was writing in sonata form, and sometimes he really did. But as often as not, he was doing something else completely, completely different and original. And he probably knew that too, but we just don't know. I mean, nobody talked to him about it. It's really kind of amazing how in the Bruckner literature, there was never a point where anybody asked him an intelligent question about his musical practice. It could be he wouldn't have had an answer. Sometimes they know, sometimes they don't. Sometimes they operate out of instinct. But Bruckner's handling of sonata form was unique from the very beginning. And I'm going to take some time to go through particularly the first movement of the symphony, just to give you a sense of how it operates and how Bruckner's unique handling of form in particular operates in this symphony, which is fascinating because the first movement is one of the most sophisticated things he ever wrote. You know, Bruckner isn't known for being a sophisticated composer. Most people treat him as kind of an idiot savant, sort of a moron who somehow wrote music, which is ridiculous because his handling of form is incredibly shrewd and very, very smart, even if the fact that he would make cuts and revise and change things around led people to think that he was kind of bumbling and didn't know what he was after. What really was happening in Bruckner's symphonies is that what he was doing was, I think, in some ways so radical that he wasn't quite sure how to handle it. And then when he did know how to handle it, he realized he could change what he had done previously without damaging the form at all, or indeed even making it more interesting. You know, the most the most, I, I think, telling example of that is probably the Fourth Symphony, where it took him quite a while to figure out that he was writing a finale symphony, one where the weight of the symphony really belongs at the end rather than in the first movement. Most of Bruckner's symphonies, in fact, all of them up to that point, really were first movement symphonies. They were symphonies in the classical sense, where the most complex and sophisticated movement is the first movement. In the fourth, he changed it. He changed it probably on the basis of having written the fifth, which was his fifth, his fifth, his first finale symphony, the one where the weight of the argument goes all the way to the end. The sixth is another symphony, which is a first movement symphony. It's a classical symphony. So is the seventh. The eighth is a finale symphony, and the ninth, we really don't know. We really don't know exactly how it would have it would have turned out because there isn't enough of Bruckner's own <laughs> completion of the finale to really tell us where it was going or how it was going to end. But in any case, let's talk about the sixth. Like all Bruckner symphonies, it has four movements. Um, it is beautifully proportioned, these four movements. The first is the most sophisticated formally, and in some ways the most satisfying for people who like those big Bruckner climaxes at the end. The finale is lighter in style, and the question in these cases is not whether Bruckner could write a finale. You know, there was a rumor going around for many, many, many decades that Bruckner had a finale problem. He didn't have a finale problem. He knew, he knew what shape his symphonies were supposed to take, and he knew what to do to find the right finale for them. The only question the only question is the prejudice we had that romantic symphonies have to be grand finale symphonies. You know, Brahms as in his first symphony. The model was always Beethoven's fifth. 
you know, the big triumphant finale that resolves the tragedy of the opening movement or the struggle towards a resolution at the end. Bruckner symphonies very seldom follow that that outline. They really don't. They have they have their own business to mind. It's it's in general that business is some sort of some sort of contrast between the mundane worldly and the spiritual exalted and and all of that is worked out as a process through each movement in some way he's not he's not exactly heading towards a goal in his symphonies for the most part there are exceptions you know the fifth being one and the eighth being one the finale symphonies and even then he does it in his own special way Bruckner's sonata movements, generally speaking, his movements in sonata form, instead of having the standard first subject, second subject, development, recapitulation, and coda, have three subjects, always three, almost invariably. The first symphony has sort of two and a half, <laughs> but after that, they have three subjects. I like to call them animal, vegetable, and mineral because they, it kind of works. The first subject, animal, is usually a, a motif of some sort that sets the music in motion. Sometimes it's a big, beautiful melody, like at the beginning of the seventh, but as often as not, it's something sort of short and, and, and not exactly perky, because Bruckner is very seldom perky, but uh, weighty in some way. The second movement, vegetable, is lyrical, sweet, beautiful. It's his song period, he called, used to call it his song section. And it's, it's lovely and melodic and, and usually given over to the strings. And it's, it's terrific. And the, the last one, mineral. The mineral one is usually very primal sounding. It's, it, it either consists of unison melodies or, or simple primitive dance rhythms of some kind. Or, or something of that sort. And, you know, the harmony also, because it's in unison, it often becomes a modal, and which means it sounds somehow primitive and, and elemental. Although it's quite often based on the music of the, the, the animal part, which is a whole, again, a whole nother subject. The Sixth Symphony shows all of these things with particular clarity. And the examples I'm going to use are the examples from, I think, one of the great performances. It's my current favorite, which is which is uh, Georg Tintner with the New Zealand Symphony, believe it or not. And the reason I choose this as my, my current favorite is not just because Naxos lets me use musical examples for you. It's because I think Tintner's performance, first of all, he's using an orchestra, the New Zealand Symphony, which is not one of the great orchestras in the world, although they're very good, like most of the, what you might call second tier orchestras, but it's because the interpretation shows what a great Bruckner conductor he is. It's such a smart interpretation, and because it's a smart interpretation, he really gets the orchestra to surpass itself. I mean, they're really playing, and you you hear that. You hear the, the exaltation throughout the piece, especially in the finale. It's a wonderful, wonderful interpretation with where in, from a place where you wouldn't expect it. And so that's why um, I'm giving my vote to this particular recording of Bruckner VI, the Georg Tittner New Zealand Symphony version on Naxos. Here it is, just in case. I'm going to be holding this up a lot as we show these musical examples. Now, as I said, Bruckner's sonata movements generally have three subjects, animal, vegetable, mineral. But what, what most people don't tell you is that Bruckner's form is not entirely sonata dependent. That's just the launching point for what he's going to do. Now, some of you have noticed, you know, his form tends to be modular. Bruckner writes in blocks, and these blocks can have a whole bunch of themes and things going in them, and then they stop, and then he starts with another one, and then it stops, and then he does another one. Sometimes they interrupt each other, sometimes they sort of die away, but usually he doesn't write transitions. They kind of just sit there next to each other. And for that reason, his handling of form has been considered extremely clumsy, and nothing could be further from the truth. And what we're going to see that makes his handling of form so interesting is that the modular form, that is the block-like shape of his ideas and the sonata process don't always align. 
They don't have to align. That's what allows him to create large structures because let's face it, and some people still think this, that you know, one, one block sits next to another block, sits next to another block. It's all stop and go, stop and start. There's no continuity, there's no shape. That's not true. What you have to get a sense of is how these different formal strategies overlap and, and combine because it's the overlap that creates the continuity. That's what gives his forms their, their, their feeling of inevitability and their, their successful balance of, of structure. Sonata movements are essentially based on harmony. They're based on the departure from a home key, the return of the home key, and the satisfying reaffirmation of that home key. Modular form that Bruckner does is often melodic. Um, it's based on his the tunes of the motives, and it's not entirely, you know, in tempo areas and other things that are in his his modules, but Bruckner's harmony was also very, very original and sometimes very capricious. So it's not exactly a harmonic concept at all. It's based on a different musical quality. And in the first movement of the sixth, you can hear this with great, great specificity because there is yet a third modular principle operating in the first movement of the third, and that principle is rhythm. Every idea that Bruckner presents, and you'll hear this when I play them for you, in the first movement of the sixth, has a theme and a rhythm, an ostinato. There are three types of ostinatos in the first movement of the Sixth Symphony, most of which accompany the melodies, one of which does not, and I'll, I'll show you how that works in a second. The first module, which is the principal subject of the Sonata Four movement, is a theme with a rhythmic ostinato that is chun cha 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 chun cha 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 chun cha 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 chun. Let's listen to it. Let me play it for you. Here it is. Let's see. Let me hold this up while we do it. Okay, so you've heard it, right? It's that rhythm. Now that rhythm persists for the entire first module, the whole thing. Now, the second, the vegetable module, that was the animal module, is the song period. And the ostinato in this case is slow quarter note triplets, which are sort of like bum, 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 but, but they're accompaniments. They're on the bottom. You have to listen carefully. It's in the bass line. And eventually they surface. But again, the entire module is permeated by that steady rhythm in slow triplets. And here's the beginning of it. Okay, now we're going to go to the third subject. Now the third subject, like I said, mineral, <laughs> is, is a, a harsh unison theme between brass and, spr and strings. It goes da 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 dum pa pa pum pum pa da 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 pa pa pum da 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 da. You probably know it if you know the symphony, right? Um, and I'm not going to play it because that's not the important part. The rhythm that this generates, not at the same time, but afterwards, it builds up a certain amount of energy, and this energy generates a certain spin. And that spin is a rhythm in fast triplets, eighth note triplets that are da 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 da. That's how it works out. So here is the end of the mineral, the third module or the third theme of the sonata form exposition.
Okay, so that is your exposition. And you've heard how there are three separate rhythmic modules which continue. Now these continue on into the development section, what passes for the Sonata development section. Now, Bruckner's developments are, are legendary for being fairly non-developing. He doesn't develop themes in the way that classical composers did. The best he can usually do is, is invert one of the, <laughs> in the principal subject, he plays it upside down. But what happens is that different elements from the various modules combine in layers. It's as much a, a vertical process as a horizontal process. And in this case, in this case, in the case of the development, what you hear is the fast triplet rhythm from module three, combined with the inversion, the upside down version of the main theme, the theme, not the rhythm, from module one. Now you remember the theme, da da da, bum 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 bum, right? Da da. Well, you turn that upside down, you get ba da ba da 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 ba da. That's all it is. You just turn it upside down and play it. So here you have the triplet rhythm running through the development section with the inverted first subject on top of it. There. Now, you know, that might not sound like much, but it's really quite fascinating. First of all, it changes the entire character of the theme, number one. Number two, uh, you know, what we need to understand is that this first movement is so obsessed with these rhythmic modules, which overflow. I mean, the third one, the triplet one, it doesn't stop at the end of the third subject. It moves right through the development section. So, so the formal blocks that Bruckner is working with are overlapping. They're not all lined up. They do line up, for example, in the second symphony. That's why he has pauses <laughs> you know, between each of them. And that's why he was laughed at at that, at that point. It was only gradually that he came to realize that what he was doing, that his handling of the modular form did not necessarily have to align with the tonal argument that was being carried on by the sonata form, and that by misaligning these things deliberately, he could create his own natural and inevitable sense of momentum. And that's what it's really all about. So the critical point in any development section is the end, where you get to the re recapitulation, where you're going to bring back the first theme only here. This is what's so cool about it. The return of module one of the principal theme, the first subject with its ostinato rhythm does not correspond to the sonata form tonal recapitulation. In fact, that tonal recapitulation is touched on for just a moment. And I'm going to put up a little something up there uh, when it happens. So you'll know when it happens. And then Bruckner immediately jumps into another key and, and goes someplace else. It's, it's absolutely wonderful how he handles it. So I'm going to play this whole passage and you'll hear that the actual return of module one overlaps and goes beyond on both sides. It both precedes and succeeds what ought to have been, but actually isn't, the sonata form recapitulation. So listen to this and you'll see exactly what I mean.
You see, there you go. And you saw where I indicated where the, the harmonic sonata form repetition could be, but actually it's delayed because Bruckner still has to recapitulate. I mean, formally recapitulate. And he does it a little bit later when you get the actual return of the opening theme as it was first played in the cellos and basses with the violin rhythm on top and with some additional uh, woodwind counterpoints. So here, let's listen to that. Now, all of this, all of this, this delayed recapitulation, then the actual sonata form recapitulation, all of this is one big, giant recapitulation of module one, <laughs> block one, with its ostinato that goes from that moment I started it with that loud eruption all the way through to the return of the vegetable module, module number two, when that comes back. And... This one example, there are many, many others in Bruckner because this became part of his standard operating procedure. All of this shows you how he's able to create tension in his music by very, very non-traditional means, by, by misaligning what the, the return of certain rhythmic and melodic ideas with the harmonic uh, basis of sonata form. And, and I hope that I made that very clear. The rest of the movement is is pretty pretty straightforward you know you hear the second subject and then you hear the third subject and then it it the triplets the spin that it generates overflows into the coda and what happens in the coda is quite marvelous it's one of the great codas i'm not going to play it a whole thing for you because you will have the symphony and you can play it for yourself but what happens in the coda is that all three rhythmic ideas come together it's the one point in the movement where all of it comes together. You get the triplet rhythm is in the strings. The the slower triplet rhythm is in the in the in the brass, and the ostinato the bump ba da 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 dum ba da 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 dum is in the timpani, and they're all going at the same time. That's what makes this symphony rather difficult to play. You know, one of the the great failures in Bruckner's Sixtum is Herbert von Karajan's Berlin Philharmonic recording, where at that moment of fake recapitulation, that climax. The orchestra starts to get a little bit out of sync. It's a very tricky piece to do rhythmically because you have vertical combinations of simultaneous rhythms and you have to keep them all keep them all properly aligned. But that's my take on Bruckner's handling of form, at least at the first movement of the sixth. And he does this in other places too. For example, in the finale of the fifth, where you have that enormous fugue, right? The fugue actually overlaps the recapitulation, or what should be the recapitulation of the finale. It just spills right over into it and keeps on going. These are ways that Bruckner achieved the continuity that his critics deny him. And I think to continue to insist that he didn't know what he was doing when it came to form is just not to pay attention to what his forms do, because this is all extremely clearly expressed in the music. And you do hear it. You may not be conscious all the time of what you're hearing or why, but it's 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 all there on the surface of the music. It's all there for you to hear. But what's fascinating to me about the first movement of the sixth is that so pervasive is the rhythmic element as an organizational principle, an independent organizational principle in this movement, that there's only about two minutes of music in the entire movement, which is like 16, 17 minutes, where one of those three ostinatos, the slow triplets, the fast triplets, or the dump ba da 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 dump beginning thing, is not present. It is always there. It is always there determining where we are and what's happening as the music progresses and creating its own inevitable and inexorable sense of momentum. Now, Bruckner never ever handled, handled rhythm the same way he did in the first movement of the sixth in any other symphony. He uses other techniques and other hand treatments of rhythm, uh, including in the sixth, you'll see. He, he used rhythm differently than he did here. Here, it, it became an idea in and of itself. In his other, 
in his other symphonies, he might use harmony, he might use texture, he might use melody, he might use motive. There were many, many other musical qualities he could use. But here he's particularly obsessive when it comes to rhythm, which makes, I think, his organizational technique particularly easy to hear. And that's why I wanted to show it to you now. Now, the second movement, the second movement is in his classic sonata form. That is three subjects and their subjects. They're not modules the way the way that uh, we heard in the first movement. And and they're all in slow tempo. It's an adagio, obviously. And the movement has a real development section and a formal recapitulation and coda. It's a very beautiful movement. And those two, those three, those, those all, I should say two, I should say also, otherwise we'll get confused with numbers. Those three subjects are, you know, respectively, a lament, a lament and a hymn, more or less, a, a um, song, a song theme, a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful song theme, and finally a dirge, a funeral march at the end. And, that, and those are just the three elements, and the movement plays for 16 minutes or so, 17 minutes, sometimes longer and very slow performances. But it's, it's incredibly beautiful, and formally it's perfect. There, there's nothing that needs to be said about it. The only thing I want you to keep in mind is the oboe sort of lament in the first subject. And I'm going to play it for you because it's very important. so much have to remember the melody, but remember that rhythm. But um but um but um but um in a minute. So the scherzo is is a typical Bruckner scherzo. It's an A B A form. And this one is 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 quite quite wonderfully nocturnal and a little spooky and kind of Mendelssohnian. Um, and the trio, the middle section is uh, a combination of the trio of the one in the Eroica symphony for three horns. Um, combined with the theme from the first movement of the Fifth Symphony. Now, the finale has come in for a lot of flack in, uh, among non Brucknerians, particularly because um, it's supposed to be too light and, again, formally dysfunctional and whatnot. The fact is, the form is almost exactly the same as that of the first movement. I mean, aside from the fact that it's a sonata form movement with three subjects, the way Bruckner handles these subjects with the, the overlapping modules and form, especially in the recapitulation, is exactly what he does in the first movement. So if you think the first movement is successful, then the finale is just as successful. He is not dealing with rhythm independently in the same way that he did in the first movement, but he does handle all of the same elements from a slightly different perspective to, to give them a lighter and more relaxed take. Although the opening of the finale is similarly dark. You know, this is nominally a symphony in A major, but Bruckner's handling of harmony is often modal rather than tonal. And all you need to know about that, what that means is that it tends to mix major and minor. So the fact that this may be a key in a, a symphony in a major key doesn't necessarily mean it's going to sound happier than his symphonies in minor keys. His harmony was always very, very free, and it's dictated more by what he wants to express melodically within each block of sound, within each module. And only the overall tonal trajectory is going to stick with within the uh, harmonic ambit that the symphony is nominally, nominally pursuing, that is, in this case, A major. So the opening of the finale is somewhat dark, and it contains two elements. Its first idea has two separate elements, this dark opening theme, and then a heroic fanfare idea in a happy, bright major key. That's that. The second subject, the vegetable, is again um, a song thing with a beautiful, beautiful, prayerful moment. One of those moments of stillness and humility that everyone sort of means when they talk about Bruckner being a spiritual composer. There's a gorgeous one in the second subject of this finale. And the last one is the really important one. Why? Because it's it's a joke. 
It's funny. It's humorous. It's light. It's dancey. But what it also is, is a transformation of the oboe lament from the slow movement, believe it or not. I'm going to take a moment and play you once again that oboe lament from the slow movement so that you can see exactly what I'm talking about here. Okay, and now I want you to hear the transformation of that very same idea as the mineral, the third subject in the finale of the, of the Sixth Symphony. Here, listen to this. See what I mean? And actually, if you think about it, that particular rhythm, that ba dum ba da da ba dum ba da, is actually a, a an idea that occurs throughout the symphony, rather rather prominently in the first subject of the first movement. After we hear ba da da ba 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 ba, the part I didn't play you was ba dum ba dum ba ba da 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 da. It's the same thing. It's also the trio of the scherzo. Bum ba ba dum ba da, dum ba ba da ba da. So, you know, that's one of the ways that Bruckner creates unity and his idea of thematic transformation, which gives his music that additional emotional range because he doesn't repeat these things. He, he transforms them into something other than what we originally thought they were. And that is what makes it marvelous. Now the other the other charge leveled against this finality, which finale, pardon me, which I think is absolutely absurd, is that the ending doesn't work terribly well. Bruckner's endings usually end with the main subject of the symphony brought back in combination with whatever else is going on. So we expect to hear da 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 bum 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 and indeed we do. The success of the coda, of the end of this finale, really depends on the conductor, on how well they do it, on how well they bring that theme back, what they do when it comes back, how they pace it, how they handle the final chord. So many conductors just sort of run it off a cliff. You know, they run and it stops and they cut off and it sounds like it's unsatisfying and it can be unsatisfying. Tintner is not unsatisfying. Listen to how he handles the end of the symphony. It has never been done better, I assure you. right? Beautiful, satisfying. And that is my sort of discussion on the handling of form in Bruckner's Sixth Symphony. There's a lot more we could talk about, really a lot more. But I think you get a sense of how the symphony operates and more how Bruckner's form is intentional. He knew what he was doing. He really, really knew what he was doing. And it's an indication, of course, that he really felt confident in what he did in the sixth, that it never had to be revised. He never did anything to it. He never had any second thoughts about it. And so that's great. And that was, of course, the New Zealand Symphony Orchestra with Georg Tinter, that Tinter, Tintner, sorry, Georg Tintner on Naxos. But now let's talk about the other nine out of 10 recordings that I brought just to, to, to round off the discussion and we'll see which ones they are. Now, now these are my top 10. There are others. Not in this list, I should tell you, are 
Dafnani? Blumstedt? Shai? I thought, I mean, some of them are very good. They didn't make my top 10. They may be in yours, so that's fine. You don't have to tell me about it. I know they exist. <laughs> so there you go. All right, first, and probably oldest, I think, Kylebirth, Joseph Kylebirth. You remember this is in the big Kylebirth box because I don't know where you find it. This was originally on Teldeck with the Berlin Philharmonic. It was the only Bruckner 6 that existed in stereo for, it seemed like, forever outside of complete sets and things like that. I mean, it just, it, you just couldn't get Bruckner 6 very easily. It, it always went out of print really fast. And the Kylebirth was just one of those beautiful Singleton Bruckner performances. Next, Skrovachevsky. We know what a great Brucknerian he is. We know what a great Bruckner cycle this is. The sixth is every bit up to his standards. It's an absolutely wonderful performance, effortless, organic, natural, and, and beautiful from start to finish. Next, this one may surprise you a little bit. I don't know, it's up to you. Celli, Celli Bidacha, the world's slowest human being. Now, this Bruckner sixth, one of the things about, you know, Celli is that his Bruckner was, was slow, but he knew what he was doing when he was slow. You know what I mean? He really did. He, he used the slowness to make you hear things when he was at his best. Sometimes he was just slow and boring. But his sixth is interesting to me because although it's slow, it's not interminably slow, first of all. And because the symphony is, especially the first movement, is so, is so heavily based on rhythm and movement, he can't stop it. <laughs> Not even Celli can stop it. It's got to move, and it does move. It's a more magisterial movement, but it moves. It's a beautiful, beautiful, glowing performance that I think shows his art really at, it, at its best. Next, High Tink, his latest one. This is the one he did with the uh, Bavarian Radio Symphony, and it's on their own label. And this is, this is one of the best of Heiting's late recordings. It really is. It's a beautiful performance. He did a good sixth in his other, other his original Bruckner box with the Concertgebouw, somewhat light, light footed, I think maybe. But I think this remake is absolutely beautiful and it's very nicely recorded. It's a gorgeous performance. Next, oh my goodness. We have a lot of these, don't we? Klemps. Otto Klemperer, this is the great six. This was the reference recording for zillions of years. I think now that there are so many other good ones finally that have come out, um, it's not quite the reference it used to be, but it's still great. And it has many, many unique features. You know, there's there's always Klemperer's emphasis on woodwind sonority. There's his very interesting handling of tempo, especially the first movement, which basically goes at one speed all the way through, and which has, as a result, unprecedented unity, not stiffness a la Yasha Horenstein. I mean, unity a la Otto Klemperer. And the slow movement, of course, you know, Klemperer was famous for playing fast movements, slow and slow movements movements fast. It's his typical, unsentimental, flowing, beautiful, beautiful performance. And he's got the Philharmonia at absolutely the top of its game. It's a glorious recording. It was beautifully recorded in its day. It still sounds great. The Klemper Bruckner Sixth is a marvel. Next, Jochum. This is the Staatskapelle Dresden Jochum, not his Deutsche Grammophon Jochum. Uh, the Deutsche Grammophon Jochum one uh, with the uh, Bavarian radio, but I think that, that this Staatskapelle Dresden performance is a smoker. It's exciting. It's it's unaffected. It's just it's just full of life. It's like, you know, it's Joachim's best performances always are. They just breathe. You know, the whole performance, it just breathes with 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 this wonderful impulsiveness and character and the orchestra plays fantastically, especially the brass, which are so crucial always in Bruckner. It's a wonderful, wonderful performance. Next, oh, let me see how many we got left. Oh, only three. Gunter Wand. Now, Gunter Wand was a Bruckner Six guy. He recorded it three times. All of his performances are wonderful. His last one with NDR on RCA, which God knows where it is or if you can find it, may be his best. This is his earliest, the one with Cologne Radio. And I have to say, it's great. It was one of the highlights of this cycle. And it was really the performance that for me um, really told me that, that Wand was a special Brucknerian because, you know, there, there was a time, at the time this came out, there weren't so many Bruckner Sixths out there. And to hear someone really nail it, 
was it was a wonderful thing. It was, you know, I was I was very happy when I heard that Bruckner Six because I finally heard a performance. You know, I could say, yes, people can can do this. They can do it. And what performance of Bruckner Sixth or survey of Bruckner Six would be complete without mentioning Baron Boim. Yes, this is his first one, his Chicago one. None of the others are anywhere near as good. Baron Boim is one of those guys who was sometimes best when he was earliest. Maybe not in Beethoven, but uh, you know his his Bruckner cycle in Chicago is easily easily his best Bruckner cycle. The playing is gorgeous. The performance is fresh and impulsive. You know he was sort of a baby Fortwängler in those days. You know he was trying to do that flexible you know, exciting Bruckner, and sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't. But in this cycle, it really it really went awfully well. And this is one of the great, great, great Bruckner Six. It's on uh, Deutsche Grammophone, if you can still find it, you know, because he did a video of the whole cycle that he did. He did a, the Berlin of the whole cycle, which isn't terrible, but it's not great. And and that's the one to get if you want Baron Boehm's Bruckner. And finally, finally, this is a great Bruckner, Bruckner Six. Horst Stein. Thank God for Decca Eloquence. It's in this Vienna Phil Bruckner box. Horst Stein was one of those terribly, terribly underrated conductors who really knew what he was doing. He did a great sixth. I, I, there aren't that many sixths with the Vienna Phil. I don't know. Maybe that's the only one. They hadn't done it very often. So if you want to hear the Vienna Phil do Bruckner Six, I think this is what you got to hear. I mean, some, some of you may turn up another one. I don't know. Or there may be something I'm obviously missing and it's just, you know, my brain just isn't working properly. But this is a great Bruckner Sixth. And uh, another beautiful performance is, is wonderful for the conductor who plays the piece with, with complete command, but also for the orchestra because, of course, they're one of the great Bruckner orchestras and you don't get that many chances to hear them in the sixth. However... As I told you before, we're going to wrap it up where we started with Georg Tintner on Naxos. Now, I don't like everything about this cycle. He uses some weird editions, like the original edition of the eighth, which is like lousy compared to the revision. And, and you know, the original version, I think is, they do the original version of the fourth, too, or he does the some extra finales in the fourth. You get a lot of music in here. But by and large, it's one of the great Brooker cycles. Never mind, never mind whether it's... Uh, you know, you agree with his choice of edition on everything. And the sixth with the New Zealand Symphony in here is really, I think, very, very special. Special for its sympathy, its intelligence, its warmth, its humanity, and not least for having him get that orchestra, which is not, as we know, a Bruckner orchestra, really sound like they care. It's a performance that just exudes love and caring attention. And that's a wonderful thing to hear. So keep on listening, folks. That is my overview of Bruckner Sixth, and I sure as hell hope that you're going to give it a listen now and maybe uh, hear it with fresh ears. You never know. We can only hope. Thank you, and see you later.